Welcome everyone, my name is Ali and on camera with me today I have got Senzo and we are very happy to take you guys on a bumbo on this beautiful afternoon. Seems like it is a bit of a windy afternoon so we've had a little trouble with the birds. It seems like the starling that we had earlier today has been flying up and down, up and down. I think it's just keeps being blown away by the wind to be honest and then when it's too windy or when it spots a little insect down on the ground it'll come down and then it'll feed off of it and then try to perch back again so it has been a real struggle for the birds again today we are having a bit of a weird weather situation the it's quite warm so the temperature today is 28 degrees celsius and 82 fahrenheit and isn't that nice that we can just swap the numbers around but it is quite windy, not too sure what the wind speed is, but enough to trouble all the little birds flying around. So we had a wonderful finale for the Great Migration um, series this morning and I hope everybody thoroughly enjoyed that. And now today we get to carry on all the way from South Africa, from the Greater Kruger National Park. So if you've got any questions or comments, send them through using the hashtag Safari Live or send your questions via the YouTube channel because we love hearing from all of you. I think we're going to leave this colorful birds and carry on, see if maybe we can find any other creatures around. I would really hope to see any cats this afternoon, that would be quite nice. Isn't today catcher day? So let's get started and let's see if we can find pretty much any of the beautiful creatures that roam around this area. I believe this morning on drive also the guy said that there were lots of elephants around. Wonder if they'll still be around with this wind. I would imagine that maybe they'll go into either the drainage lines or some other areas where the, it isn't as windy. We are gonna head all the way down to Twindams I believe and we're gonna send you guys across to Tristan who wants to say hello. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our sunset safari from a rather sunny Juma Game Reserve. It's really nice to be in some warm sunshine for a change this week. As Ali mentioned, my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got a VM the Wildebeest and it's very good to have VM back. It's the first time I've driven with VM in about six months, isn't it Wilde? It's quite a while since we've been together. Now remember it is live, it is interactive, hashtag Safari Live or YouTube chat if you want to get hold of us and hopefully we're going to have a really busy afternoon. I've just been catching up with Stefan from Chitwa and he's been giving me all the updates from this morning so there are lots of juicy little bits of information. None of them really helping us too much here on human right now but could potentially lead to lots of things later in the afternoon so the first one is that I just chatted with because I was tagged in a number of posts yesterday regarding Shongile and sightings of Shongile now Shongile apparently was seen on Hoffman's the same day we saw Shadow and Cub crossing out when they finished their kill so I don't know how many days ago that was I think it's four days ago and she was seen on Hoffman's apparently Steph said he saw her and he can confirm that it is her and she was on a termite mound and just fine and just taking it very easy so it's good news that Shungile is still around just lying low but she is around and is still doing just fine he said there was no visible signs of injury or anything like that so for those of you that have been a bit worried about her at least that's really really good news as to the fact that she's okay at the moment now the other bits of interesting information is Hosanna is on a kill just south of the boundary and it sounds like Kuchava and Tingana are mating again somewhere on the Nets Chitwa boundary but they were inside a net and no visible sign from Chitwa itself but we know last time they mated they came north in the afternoon and so hopefully they are gonna head towards Chitwa Dam so we'll have to just keep an eye out for those two but we are going to head towards Treehouse and we'll just check around this western side I believe the Inkahuma Pride was also seen this morning there's a monkey hello monkey now vivid monkeys are not the most relaxed individuals and you can see that vervet has then ran away from us. I'm going to try to get a little bit closer and just see if we can get a view of it and see if we can actually see this monkey. Now these monkeys were alarm calling this morning around Ingers. There was also guinea fowl going crazy. Have you seen another one Vildi? Okay good. Ah, oh, there we go in the top of the tree. So there's also a few clouds in the distance. I wonder if we're not going to get some rain maybe this afternoon. It looks a bit ominous, doesn't it, in the background. But there's our monkey silhouetted back against those white grey clouds at the moment. And they have got such a great vantage point from up there. So this is why monkeys are such a useful tool for us as guides. Because often 
these guys will alert us to ongoings in the bush from up on that height particularly in the dry vegetation that we've got now they've got an incredible field of view they're going to be able to spot all kinds of different predators and they will then make noises and that will alert us that there is something in the area and we can then come and have a look and try and find them so i was saying this morning monkeys were alarm calling around ingas and i have a funny feeling maybe there was a leopard lurking somewhere around the dam area or maybe just down behind the dam wall you never know maybe tumba was around or Tundi, they've also been hanging around and who knows even maybe Shongile could be around as well so just want to check this area nicely make double sure that there's no tracks that I can pick up for a leopard I did ask Rexon who was out this morning he said he didn't find anything in this area but you never know there was definitely something that was disturbing both mammals and birds and making them all very upset right well our monkey is down the tree so we're going to head southwards So, Nem and many other viewers, you are wondering what film we watched last night. Well, do we have a saga to tell you? So, Megan May Nelson, who is directing this afternoon, says, was tasked with downloading said films that got the votes last night, which was, I think, Central Intelligence and, and Wonder Woman. Megan has showed us, no guys, don't worry, it's downloading, everything is going to be fantastic. We had dinner, everyone got amped for the movies, got sorted out, got popcorn, got... Lou even made her special chip dip that she has. She made that. We got everything all perfectly sorted out. FC was pimped out with speakers and screens and the whole works. And well, the movie downloaded all of about 20 minutes. And so that ended that whole situation. So we watched the first 20 minutes of Central Intelligence. And that was the end of our movie night, really. And we then started watching Chronicles of Narnia because somebody had that on a drive that was handy, which led to myself and Ali and Megan all promptly falling asleep in about 10 minutes I don't know why we were all tired and then I think Vildi who was next was it Louise or you Louise, Louise was next and then VM and the cam ops were the ones that held the fort down they were the ones that stayed up the longer with longest with Senzo finishing the movie and the only one to do so what's that V VM made it 30 minutes apparently, but myself and Ali didn't do very well at all. Megan didn't even make it to the first time that they discovered the wardrobe, for those of you that have watched the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So Megan was, I think, about five minutes in total into her movie and was down and sleeping. So movie night was a bit of a fail in that we didn't really watch anything, but it was still fun and we had a good time and a lot of good laughs amongst everybody and there was always a little bit of fun. Now, Megan is just giggling in my ear and she's telling me that I need to link away to Ali. Maybe she's hoping that Ali won't rain down on her as much as we have. So let's go and see where Ali is and what she's going to be up to for the rest of the afternoon. I think Tristan has <laughs> pretty much explained how wonderful our <laughs> movie night was last night. And I think this is another family that would also thoroughly enjoy uh, <laughs> a movie night just to fall asleep all together. And of course, it's the beautiful elephants that we've got all around us. It's a nice big breeding herd of elephants. So the reports from this morning were indeed true that there are lots of elephants, uh, elephants, <laughs> elephants around. And we're not too far away from Gary Dam. So I am hoping that eventually they're going to start making their way through. Because the more we look around, it seems like the more there are elephants just hiding in the bush. And now we've got this beautiful young bull coming into the open. Always nice to spend some time with the elephants. And it's funny how yesterday we pretty much drove around all of Juma and we only found that um, the few individuals of the short trunk herd. And now today we've already found quite a, quite a big herd. So I would really like them to start interacting and carry on feeding. It is lovely to spend some time with elephants, especially on days like today. Now I feel like it is a little bit windy still, so that's why they're still um, amongst the bushes and just using all of the quarries really to protect themselves from the wind. Because if you can imagine, if you for our normal sized ears already, the wind is a bit annoying when it blows too hard. So can you imagine having ears the size of an elephant? What probably all of the things that they can hear. Hmm. Maybe he's taking it a step too far and just hiding or <laughs> using the trees as earmuffs. I think there's another one that's also going to come into the open. They are all in between the thickets, so it's not the easiest way for us to see them. So I want to give them a little bit of a chance. I'm sure they're all going to start eventually coming into the open. Hello, young boy. Also heading into the, where the rest of the family is. 
Hmm. Seems like they are all enjoying the Gwari bushes. Now, seems like maybe the matriarch is gonna cross the road in front of us, Senzo. Right there. See, Nak, you're wondering how many elephants in a herd. Now, I just want to keep an eye on this one in front of us because she was slowly moving. And then, of course, as soon as we mention it, she stops. See, Nak, um, elephant herds can vary in size quite a bit. They can be just a female and perhaps two of her calves, the older one and then the younger one. And that can consist of a breeding herd and just a basic family unit. And sometimes you get groups of elephants that are very, very big. Sometimes maybe over 50, 100 elephants altogether I've seen. What does happen is if the herd gets way too big, then you'll see that family units are smaller, nucleus, for example, um, a female and her sister and the young ones, or perhaps just one female and her youngest, they'll start splitting from the rest of the group, and they but they will still remember each other. So it's actually something really awesome to watch when you get uh, very big herds of elephants that come and meet each other again, that are related, but perhaps haven't seen each other in a while. And it's very well described in all of the studies that have been done um, by all of the elephant researchers. It's the way that they greet each other. And almost like the lion's greeting ceremony, the elephants, there's a lot of excitement. You can see all of their temporal glands um, secreting substances. They touch each other with their trunks. They put each other's trunks in their mouth. So it's a very emotive thing to watch when that does happen. But like I said, size uh, of a herd can vary. And I think the one that we are looking at here, it's probably about 10, 15 individuals or so. And, the, ooh, yeah. This particular herd, or in general, all of the breeding herds that we look at, it's a female and the young ones and then the young males. Normally the big adult bulls, they won't be together in the same breeding herd or they won't spend all of their time with the females. They'll be happy to just join in whenever they pick up the scent of one of the females coming into heat. And then if they get disinterested or if there are no females in heat, then they'll just pretty much leave them and carry on doing their own thing. Now that is a bit of a tough spot for these elephants. Beautiful. Salad, so, you're wondering if uh, the old myth of elephants being scared of mice because they can go up their trunk, if it's actually true. Well, funny enough, Mythbusters, <laughs> they investigated this whole thing just to try and find out if it is actually true because it all started as a tale. I think the ones in front of us are now definitely going to start moving. They're just taking their time to do so. There's no rush in Africa, as they always say. So Mythbusters actually analyzed the way or they they used captive elephants to try and find out if they were actually scared of the of the mice because often how would such a big elephant find a little mice but what it was discovered was that perhaps not so much the fear of the mouse going up its trunk but uh, rather the elephants are scared of the movement or of the sudden movement that's something they didn't know it was there that they probably can just see by uh, on the corner of their eyes so often they'll just get spooked by this little thing that's moving around and that's what they determine was actually what the elephants are scared of so not mouse mice itself but just the <laughs> their potential to give them a fright because they move underneath the branches of the trees or they move in between the grass and then all of a sudden by the time that the elephants see them they've already spooked them. Now I'm going to try and reposition see if maybe we can get a bit of a better view of this girl so I think we are going to manage that if I just go at a little bit of an angle. seems like Tristan has managed to find some very big birds so let's go have a look while we chat away with this beautiful herd well we have we wrapped our vultures nest so I'm down in the southwestern corner I haven't quite gotten to treehouse dam yet and that's because I want to just come and have a little look around for any signs of a shadow in the cub or shongile coming out of Hoffman's and that's why I'm down in the southwestern corner Vildi, can I ask you, just before we get into the vultures, there's two birds here that seem to be having a fight with one another. Oh no, they're being chased around now, and I can't see which two it is, but there was two birds that were fighting, and they were chasing. It was a hornbill was one, and the other one almost looked 
a little bit woodpecker like and I wonder if the hornbill was messing around close to the nest and that's why they were fighting with each other but unfortunately they flew off sorry Vildi that's my fault but like I was saying we are actually at the vulture's nest and so the birds fighting is irrelevant at this stage we'll rather focus on our vultures it's nice because the chick is standing up really nicely this afternoon generally we only see the head of this chick poking out of the nest but there you can see it's standing up on its nest grooming itself look at how fluffy the head is in comparison to the adult the adult doesn't have nearly as much fur on its head you can see that adult there is clean it's almost got nothing a little bit of white fur but nothing major in comparison to the little one and the little one needs it because it's still a bit smaller it needs to insulate stay nice and warm remember that the vulture chicks are born in the middle of winter so they need thick feathers around the head to be able to stay nice and, and warm and to basically not freeze to death in these cold winter temperatures that we do get. Remember baby birds will be very very susceptible to changes in temperature. But it is definitely growing at a rate of knots and I think actually our timeline in terms of it flying is going to be sooner rather than later. And we were discussing this a few days ago and many were asking me what happens if this vulture flies and it has a failed attempt and it comes crashing to the ground. Well then what they will do is they will basically flap and sort of jump their way up back towards the nest so they'll just use any trees and branches they can and with the big wings that they've got they will be able to at least get close enough and even if they try and take off and they fall they'll fall onto one of these branches lower down and then they just kind of hop their way back towards the top of the nest and back to the nest itself so they won't be too badly off they obviously got to be a little bit careful because things like leopards and, and various other predators do lurk around and if they find a baby vulture down on the ground they certainly will go after it so they have to be a little bit careful but for the most part these vultures are pretty clever animals they'll just take their sort of flights in the middle parts of the day and when they can't do much then they go back onto the nest and then off they go but nice to see nonetheless it's always good just to pop in at our vulture nest and have a little look at what's going on they're taking it very easy I would imagine with this cloud rolling in and the lack of thermals that are around it's not going to be a good day for vultures to fly so we're just going to leave them there Wallo um Yes, there could have been more than one vulture chick initially. With vultures, what you'll find is a situation that they often practice siblicide. So basically, the, one of the, the young will, will either roll the egg of the other one out while it's, after it's hatched, or it will pick on the weaker one. It will be much stronger to get to food from mom, and as it gets stronger and more physical, it will eventually then pick the other one to death or kick it out of the nest, sending it tumbling to the ground. And obviously, it's then, if it doesn't die from the fall, gets preyed upon by various other predators. So there might have been another the one often vultures will lay two eggs so it is very very possible now the reason why I'm driving so slowly as we leave the vultures nest is because after the rains that we've had the tracks are not as visible as what they normally are so and better just to go a lot slower as we drive just in case Shadow or Shongile or, or the cub has walked out. All three of those leopards have very small feet so they're not going to have massive big paw prints like lions would leave and so you've got to be very careful about how you go about it and you've got to look very carefully. Also the cloud cover that's come over means the light has become a lot more dingy. You can see it's a almost grey light and so that means that we have a situation where there's not too much shadow on the road and therefore not too many visible signs of tracks. Now what there is a lot of is a lot of footprints for elephants so it seems as though they've been fairly busy over the last little bit. Now I believe Ali did have some Ellie's just now but she's got something that is a very very clever individual that follows the elephants around. We did, we had oh, a tiny little clever individual in the form of a drungo. Now we've got a young boy trying to show us who's the boss. So the drungo that was actually perched on the branch, <laughs> obviously a few seconds before you guys came back to us, is a tiny little blackbird that it's very clever in the way that it normally follows big mammals like the elephants or rhino or buffalo because as these big animals start moving around then they disturb a lot of the creatures, um, the insects that live in the grass. Ah, there we go. There's a the drungo again. So it just waits for the elephants to disturb all the insects and then as soon as it manages to see one comes down on the ground uh, on the ground, eats it and then goes back up onto its perch. So it's an easy way of almost going shopping because everything, all your options get flushed and you can just pick and choose whatever it is that you want. Now these beautiful elephants have carried on feeding around here and the young boy on the left has been giving us a bit of a hard time. I think he was just being the protector 
of the herd just making sure that we know that he is in charge and he's not afraid of us but as you can tell and this works normally with most of the animals around he's relaxed and then he's carried on feeding proof that it's not really bothered by our presence over here so any good day and any good time to carry on feeding on all of the branches of the trees and I'm sure the elephants more than anyone they're waiting for the green lush grass and leaves to come out so that they can carry on feeding or eating more good things. Dead ahead time you're wondering if an elephant look at the power of that tr tusk if you're wondering if elephants that get separated from their herd if they can join another one well I think there there are a few variables that we should take into consideration now for example if it were a super group of elephants like I was saying earlier they're able to recognize family members from non family members let's put it that way so if for example if we had a very big group and one of the members from from a certain family decided to start hanging out with the other family likely the other ones will accept it because they would still recognize it as a family member because the whole social structure of the elephants is based around the family and the raising of the young ones but for example if we had the case of um of a completely strange elephant coming into a particular herd i don't think they would be so accepting and so accommodating elephants are in fact more due to biological stress than than anything else they are they don't adopt each other's scalps or if it's happened it's been very rarely documented normally they'll um they'll they'll help each other raise their young ones but when it comes to suckling and providing milk for one pretty much every mother takes care of their own one What you guys doing there? I think this young bull is <laughs> bullying its mother off that <laughs> that yummy branch. Look how he uses his t uh, his foot to try and break it open. So you can still see there's a lot of dust around, despite all the rain that we've had in the last few days. So I'm sure we're going to need a lot more rain for the dust to settle and for the elephants to actually start enjoying food that it's a little bit more nutritious, more, more luscious, more e or easier to find and um, to find and eat. There we go. As always, the twig goes at the back of the mouth. What? Ash, you're wondering if elephants ever stop growing. Well, to my knowledge, they they don't really start stop growing throughout their lifetime, but when they reach a certain age then the growth um, diminishes it's not at obvious the same as their tusks they carry on growing throughout their lifetime so I would say for elephants normally when they're about I want to say a good average about 30 or so though they'll, they'll almost speak like humans when they reach the, a certain age what I think when they were about 21 you'll get your growth limit and then if you do start growing from there for the elephant in the elephant's case at least it's not as accentuated as it has been until that particular time as far as I'm, I'm aware I want the rest of this herd to start coming out of the bushes and start heading towards the dam although we are still quite far away from the dam so I think it's gonna take them at least a few hours to get there and it's funny how elephants just always take it easy and I mean such a big animal has got to feed a lot and so they spend the majority of the day feeding if you consider a very big elephant they'll eat anything between 300 350 kilograms of food a day so it's quite a lot to be able to pretty much pluck all the grass from the ground and break all the leaves and then eat all the fruits and everything else that's around so it's no easy task keeping an elephant well fed <laughs> Leslie you're wondering if elephants will take somebody else's baby if they've lost their own um, normally not because elephants are very protective of their young ones so for example um, they don't the, the whole surrogate system in elephants doesn't work that much I can see it working in a scenario where a mother has lost its calf and a calf has lost its other mother where it could potentially work in the wild but normally elephants are very um, protective of their young ones so the the females would not allow another female just to come along and just take their particular calf we've got this young bull being very cheeky with us what you doing do you want to come and feed up this terminalia or are you inspecting us 
Yeah, there is a very common thing in the behavior of elephants that's called displacement behavior. So often they will come around and inspect you and pretend that they're doing something while they're really doing something else. So this bull over here, he's pretending that he's eating and every now and again he raises his trunk, he looks in our direction, raises his ears. Hey, enough now. You've been very cheeky. Put your trunk away. Hey! Behave. We're all friends here. And I was here first. You see, young bulls always up to something. Now, the reason why I don't want to move from here, he's still just playing. I think he's just testing the boundaries. So we've got to also teach elephant manners uh, the same way that they teach us about what distance is comfortable for them. So in this case, we've been around for quite a while. And all of a sudden, I think he just came back and is trying to scare us off by pretending he's big and mean. By flapping his ears and sticking his head up and moving his trunk around. Just preparing for when the time he's got to be a very big scary bull and fight other bulls. But for now, I don't want to move just to show him that I'm not going to be bullied so easily by him. Why well, are you going to start eating now? <laughs> I would say it suggests that maybe he wanted to feed on the grass that we're in, but we're actually parked on a dry patch of land, so I don't think that's even the case. I think we're just playing a game of psychological power with this elephant. <laughs> as it often happens with the young bulls. But you can see his aggression levels weren't that high. He raised his head and then he went away and then he came back and then he went away again. So I think he's just taking a stand, but now he's resumed to feeding, so he's very relaxed, he carried on doing his own thing. Well, eating half-heartedly, I should say, because you're not really feeding, are you? See, every now and again the trunk comes up. <laughs> oh. Odie Farming, you're wondering if we can smell an elephant in must. Yes, we can. They have actually a very pungent smell because they're constantly dribbling urine. So it's, I don't even know how to describe it, but other than a very pungent smell, and you can smell it from far, far away. So whenever, normally you'll smell it before then you approach it. But this one, this is still a young bull. I would assume that he's maybe around 12, 14 years of age, not more than that. And normally elephants go into must later on in life. So this particular one is not in must. If he were, then we would see a very few um, clear tail taste. For example, he would have a lot of secretion on his temporal glands just behind his ears. So that would be dripping constantly. And then, of course, we would see its back legs constantly wet from the urine that's been dripping. And in this case, legs are very dry because he's still a young elephant. <laughs> you look like you're dancing. <laughs> Tulan, you're five years old and you're wondering why elephants like eating sticks. Well, if they have the option of eating something else other than sticks, for example, like very nice yummy leaves or fruits, then they will eat it. But at this time of the year, there isn't that much food for them. So they eat a lot of sticks for just because, so you know, if you've ever grabbed a bark of the tree, you will see that there's the tree here, the stick, and then there's the bark. And underneath the bark, if you peel it off even with your fingers, you will see that there's a very bright red or green layer. So that's what they want to eat because that's where all the sugar in the tree is. So the Ellie's actually go and eat it a lot, especially at this time of the year where there isn't that much food for them. And that's why we see them eating more sticks at this time of the year than maybe some other times. You see he's struggling there. I think this is karma that you can't pull it out straight away for being ugly to us earlier on. Yep. Well this is interesting. <laughs> well this is nice. We don't often see them going back on or going uh, kneeling just to use their tusks to be able to get 
uh, the tree or the branch right from the root, which is exactly what this one did. I actually haven't seen it in quite a while. So this is was very, very interesting. Obviously, the trunk wasn't enough or the pressure around the trunk wasn't enough to try and get it out. And I would have thought that because already of its size, it would have just used its foot to create that tension and then pretty much kick it. But I think maybe he was just after the root and he was not going to be <laughs> bullied out of eating this particular root. You are being very interesting, little boy. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're dancing again. Wrong dance, though. We're not facing that direction. Ali, you're wondering why the elephants smell us when uh, they're facing us or when we come close to them. Well, it's normally, it's their way, it's their defense of assessing what we are and what we're up to. So for a lot of the animals around, we, as humans, I would say we rely on our, either our intuition perhaps, or on our eyesight to be able to tell what a certain person or a certain being is doing. The elephants and a lot of the animals around, they're perhaps like, yes, they will use their eyesight, but they also have very uh, keen sense of smell and hearing. So that's a way of finding out what we are and what we're up to. Because remember, there's a lot of... Um, olfactory communication going around with the elephants and the creatures or the African animals or any animal um, in that regard. So there are a lot of pheromones floating around so often they will try to see if they can pick up something and then they learn to recognize us as well because they come into these areas often so they'll just pick up the smell of the vehicle and the brake fluid and perhaps maybe I don't know the way we smell and they combine it all together and they learn to recognize that smell as perhaps human smell or this is what particular humans in this area or this thing that moves around and makes a little bit of noise smells like so once they decide for that then they're like okay I've seen this once before and then they carry on and leave us alone like this one has done now he's playing shy and going all the way back behind the quarries <laughs> you have been very entertaining thank you Are you are you done with all your displays? Seems like you might be. Kaylin, you're wondering if elephants have taste buds. Well, I would assume that they do. I think the majority of the creatures, and I could be horribly wrong here, but as far as I know, all of the creatures have got taste buds and it's because of the taste buds that some species of tree have evolved to put out certain substances that make uh, certain uh, or make the leaves taste a little bit bitter for example I don't know if you've ever heard of something called tannin now tannin is a substance that the trees put out in self-defense to try and prevent the browsers like elephants, giraffe and pala from overfeeding on their on their leaves or on their flowers and so on. And it is said that the tannin or when the tree starts putting out the tannin it makes the leaves taste a little bit more bitter. So I would assume that yes just based on that on that assumption that it makes the leaves taste bitter according to some research that I might have come across in the past. And actually, yes, elephants are very well known for having a very sweet tooth, now that I think about it. Around uh, cane sugar farms, they are known to be a very problematic creature because they keep going back for more. So, definitely, I think we've, we've come on to this conclusion. We are going to send you guys across to Tristan, who has managed to find a small little grey thing. We have, we've got a little grey dacre that is moving through the grass and is now hiding itself. It was standing nicely out in the open and it has gone behind a bit of a bush. There it comes, it's just slowly bobbing its head towards Treehouse Dam. So it's, it's on a little bit of a mission and it looks like a young male. You can just see the horns sticking up between the ears there and very, very sharp straight horns and those can do quite a bit of damage. I actually find there's been a few people that have been injured by a little dacre. You wouldn't think so given the size of it but they can cause a little bit of harm those horns are about knee high and you can imagine those two in your leg is a very unpleasant experience now of course it is toilet time as well and you can see the big fluffy white tail that is lifting up and so they have a very similar following mechanism to most of our antelopes in that they have this bright white tail that allows 
anybody else that's around to see them. So if they've got a young one, if they curl that up, they, the young one can follow that white tail and be able to evade the predators and to follow the parents to safety. But you can see how well they blend in and why they're such a difficult animal often to see and, and this particular one is being very obliging and allowing us to film it for so long it's because we've parked quite far away nope, there we go that's typical diker behavior running off behind some thickets oh well nice to see though anyway and unfortunately no tracks for any of our female leopards around this southern area we've checked very carefully for shongile tracks or um shadow and cub tracks but nothing that I can see at this stage it seems as though they must still be south of this area it also looks like there's a number of impalas around treehouse dam so the chances of there being a leopard lurking here is probably quite slim but you never know it's worth just coming to double check and make a hundred percent sure now I just want to see quickly there's a road that leads in here from the eastern side and this road is a road that is always a bit of a highway for a lot of our animals so it's a road that is always worth checking very carefully so they generally come along and then there's a little pathway that comes and then they cross over towards the dam itself along this pathway so whenever we look for tracks this is one of the best places to look because it tends to trap any animal that's walked towards the dam and is seen in this area so nice to see here and to check here and to see if there's anything going on but alas nothing at the dam itself there's a situation where everything is quite quiet there's a blacksmith lapwing and there's a couple impalas on the northern side that are slowly slowly coming down there's the blacksmith lapwing that vm has got you can see just wading around on the edges of the water typical for them to be around water like this we find blacksmith lapwings spend a lot of time in areas like this it is the perfect place for them to find food and to be able to have their chicks and various other things so always associated with water but the best thing about treehouse dam is once you get onto the dam wall there's a view kind of down a drainage line on the right hand side and then a view up the drainage on the left and the best thing to do is just to stop in the middle of the dam wall and to scan around there's been a number of times where i've driven up onto the dam and i haven't seen anything and haven't really noticed anything whereas now you, and then you sit like this and you watch for a bit and all of a sudden something will just appear out of nowhere so it's always good just to stop and take it easy for a little bit the impalas look completely relaxed though so i doubt that there has been anything around the dam itself so philip you wondering what the water levels are like after the rain that we've just had are the dams still f sort of draining out and the water levels lowering by the looks of it yes philip so if you look on the edges of treehouse dam it's quite nice you can see there's the lighter soil and then it goes into darker soil so that's all from evaporation over the last few days also from various animals drinking so for the most part these dams are actually shrinking the water the rain that we had the other day was really just enough to settle the dust and the, dry, the ground is so dry at the moment that it's going to suck everything that it can and especially these trees that are starting to produce flowers and leaves they're going to be requiring lots and lots of moisture and so they're going to be sucking up a lot of that moisture which means these dam areas are still not gaining any water we're going to need a number of storms like what we had in order for these to actually fill up properly and to still be in a good healthy system i reckon if we keep going the way we're going and we don't get more rain in the next two three weeks we're going to find a lot of these dams drying quite fast particularly if we have a lot of hot weather which hopefully we will have it's always good when we have hot weather and the nice thing about that is that it drives a lot of the animals to the water holes and it will help us with being able to find a lot of the wildlife around here as soon as it starts to rain everything disperses a lot more and the wildlife becomes a lot harder but in the flip side of that is we get a lot of different things that arrive so we get a lot of birds and insects and all kinds of other things that do come into this area and this morning i actually had a classes cuckoo calling which was very exciting because the classes cuckoo is one of my favorite cuckoos it's a beautiful bird and this morning was the first time that I heard them. I'll try and find a picture of a classes cuckoo just now for you so that you can all see what they look like. They really are very pretty birds. They have this bright kind of green coloration to them. In fact, I think I've got one right here right now. Hold on two seconds. Not in real life, but in my bird book. So, if we 
just put that on the dashboard so that we can hold it tight. This is the class's cuckoo over here. It is a beautiful, beautiful white chested and an emerald green back on it. It is really one of the most beautiful birds we have out here. And they call away in the summer months. You hear them a lot. You can see the female's a little bit more drab. She doesn't have quite as much white. She's got a bit of barring around her wing areas and there's a little bit of copper kind of color that comes through on the head and then you'll find the little juvenile one has got barring all over the head and the chest area as well. So they're a wonderful bird to see. Very shy, very reclusive, not an easy bird to get onto camera or to be able to actually see. You hear them a lot more than you actually see them because they like to hide a lot. But the best places to look for them will be in the sort of riverine thickets along the Mulawati and places like that where there's lots of cover for them that they can camouflage with that emerald green um, feathering that they've got. Right, I think what Viam and I have discussed and what we're going to do, since Ali is around Twin Dams Road and she's going to go that way, we're going to head a little bit further north and we're going to go up towards where we had, well, Ali had Gajima yesterday and see if there's any sign of those leopards having a little go at each other there and see if there's any sort of indication where they went. And while we do that, I believe Ali has got a bird in a nest, well, a rather large one by the sounds of things. We did, we have managed to find, oh, yes, hello. Now, it wasn't popping out like that when we first saw it, but we are looking at a pale morph Wahlberg's eagle on its nest. This is amazing, now we're gonna be able to monitor them and find out where they are, because they're actually in a very conspicuous area. So, we found a pair um, around this area not too long ago, so I'm pretty sure that um, this is the same ones. So she's just, being a very good mother and incubating her eggs on a very cold day like today hmm, bad incubation can lead to unforming eggs i'm so excited to be able to see this sorry we struggled a little while because we just saw a bit of a tail plopping around so we've actually been circling around this street to try and find a position where we could first of all try to figure out what it was because all we could see was half an eye and <gasps> hmm. half an oh you can hear it now There we go. I'm sure that it's looking for its partner. Maybe it'll answer. Because we've had... So this is the second nest of Wahlbergs that we've found around Juma. There's one close to Twin Dams and then there's this one here. And what's quite interesting is this one seems to be a pale morph and, uh, and a normal Wahlbergs. But the same as Twin Dams. We think that that also is a pale form and a normal Wahlberg. So that's very interesting. We've got two different ones. Of the same intercombination that is um hmm that is very interesting very nice to find out now i'm gonna try to maybe go forward and see if perhaps we can have another look without that branch that's in the way over there just because it's been so obliging and just got out of the nest there's at in the beginning we could always see a head and then we went around the other side and we could just see its tail sticking out the nest but i think maybe here we'll be able oh, sorry we'll be able to see it properly <gasps> So exciting this time of the year with all the birds coming around and as Tristan was saying we were listening to the cuckoos today so maybe we're gonna try and hopefully find one if we hear one calling and show it to you guys as soon as possible because now it's the time when everything gets confusing out here with the birds so many of them are coming back and it's actually a very nice surprise or a very nice change of scenery just looking forward to re-recognizing all the different birds again beautiful Bug marker, you're wondering if we're going to get any new birds as the weather changes. Well, lots of more cuckoos still need to arrive and um, we're still waiting as well for the woodland kingfishers, but those ones will be later on. Carmine bee eaters. Oof. I'm trying to think if I'm missing uh, anyone else that's quite conspicuous around this time of the year. Well, I'm sure Tristan will be looking for booted eagles as well because he seems to love them. So it's a good time of the year. So I think the more it starts raining and the more insects and food is available for them, then, then we'll start seeing more of them around. Because uh, the Wahlbergs, they'll come back to a certain area to nest, but they are not reliant on insects to be able to survive. Whereas some of the other species that are insectivores are, so they'll normally take a little bit longer to arrive in this particular, or to come back south, and they time it so that they can have enough food. <laughs> I need to turn off this radio because it's driving me crazy. And you can see just how much the wind is blowing. 
James, you're wondering if there is any advantage over another of being color morph. Well, it is a very interesting question. And all of the studies that have been done suggesting, for example, even with the white lions and normal lions, it doesn't seem like a color morph affects animals uh, in terms of, of hunting success or in gaining a mate or anything in that sort of general behavior perspective. It seems like it's it's just another color. It's just a different type of thing because all of the, the studies that I'm familiar with, they've actually gone and look for this. Like, is being lighter than a particular animal or darker, is it different? Does it affect a particular species somehow? But it seems like there's no real difference in between. I mean, the fact that it's a pale morph mating with a dark morph, or not a dark morph, a normal Wahlberg's eagle, then it suggests that it, having a bit of a different color morph doesn't really affect the mating opportunities. So I, unless there have been new studies done in this regard, I think it's maybe just looking at it from a from a human race perspective is there an advantage of being a certain colored hair towards another one probably not probably it's the same in birds i don't think that scientifically there's anything valid to it saying that if you are of a white color it is more and i'm talking in birds here there's something more than uh, it's a bit of an edge or it's or a hindrance in terms of mating and flying and hunting so it'll be interesting to find out. I think maybe technology one day will be able to let us know exactly what the difference. Now it's a bit of a different case, for example, when we have the case of melanistic or leucistic um, birds. Now it's either too much melanin, which can also um, affect the animal somehow. And, uh, well, not leucistic, sorry, uh, albin albinos, because then they won't have pigment coloration. They'll suffer from the exposure to the sun or the, um, the ultraviolet rays a little bit more. And that can be a problem for them. But this in between, I don't think it really affects them in any particular way. <laughs> I think the wind is annoying it a little bit and was definitely calling for its partner a little while earlier. So I wonder if it's just gone all the way up there and like, okay, your turn to come back. Look after the chicks, or rather the eggs. Wallow, you're wondering how long the incubation period for Wahlbergs is. Uh, my guess it's between 80 and 90 days. I could be a little bit off in terms of the of the Wahlbergs, but I'm going to try and check in the book and then get back to you and let you know. Hopefully it'll be somewhere around there because most of the bigger birds are somewhere in between there or the dates are somewhere in between there i know it is for for vultures at least because i was looking that up the other day when we were at a vulture nest so let me just go to the trustworthy book and find out if there's anything here that, that might help me decipher this hmm vulture no i'm not looking for vultures oh seems like i can't really work my book today which is a little bit unfortunate. Rose, Marshall, Eagle, Crown, Wahlberg's Eagle. There we go. Hmm. I'm just busy looking at the book. And here is the pale morph Wahlberg's Eagle that we were looking at. And then obviously the dark morph and the buff morph. So it says interestingly here that 5 to 10% are pale form, which is not something I knew before. So I've just learned something new just by reading at the book. That is very interesting, actually. All right. Um, nope. It doesn't state anything here about how long the chicks stay in the nest. So I would say 80 to 90 days. That's where I'm going to put my guess in. And sorry, since I took the book a little bit earlier <laughs> than expected, there. I didn't expect myself to be so quick. But I would put it around there. It's a good average. And it'll be good to know, because now we know that they're here. Because we came across here a few days ago and they still weren't sitting up on that nest. So I'm sure this is a brand new nest that they've been hanging upon. Christine, you're wondering if birds of different species would nest in the same tree. Well, it does happen. You'll have perhaps 
um, the nest of little waxbills very close to the nest of some species of weavers or you'll have the nest of certain or for example the, um, the hammer cups and you'll have the eagle's nest uh, or even owl big owl's nest on top so there's always certain proximity although I think that for now the buffalo weavers that used to inhabit this particular area have gone because I think they would probably be considered dinner for the Wahlberg's eagle so I think they're just airing on the side of safety now you have been most obliging little eagle so we're gonna carry on perhaps carry on towards Gary Dam see if there's anything around there we wanted to check around for the tracks for those uh, well for it a potential predator because like we said earlier on today the monkeys and the baboons and the guinea fowl and everything was going crazy uh, in the morning so we wonder if perhaps there's not a leopard around here let's just move it around and I was hoping that it was gonna show up on the dam cam at some point but it seems like that was not the case so hopefully a little bit later on but so far we haven't had any luck with any of uh, any trucks around here so we're just gonna carry on seeing but while I do that let's go to Tristan and find out where he's going after leaving Treehouse Dam was this a track? well we're going to head northwards to go and follow up on those leopards from yesterday and just see where maybe Kojima could have gone to or if there's any sign of Mvula or that young Ingrid Dam female because apparently all three of them were seen just off Triple M last night so maybe just maybe one of them is still lurking around I hypothesize that probably not but you never know it is the only area where there's a bit of water and so maybe Sydney's dam is holding one of them and a little spotty secret for us so we're gonna head up that way and then we'll just do before the boundary along towards sort of Gauri dam side maybe check the hyena den from there I'm not sure if Ali's heading in that direction but we'll see if she's heading there then maybe we'll adjust our route slightly but otherwise that will be the general kind of focus for the afternoon it seems as though Tingana and Kuchava are still mating but south of the Chitwa boundary so no sign of them coming north just yet their, their last movement was in a westerly direction towards the vessel's boundary and so they're just taking it very easy on that side at this stage so hopefully a little bit later they'll get going Hosanna is still lying with a big round fat belly at the base of his tree with his impala kill south of Gari Main in the Mulawati apparently it's it's well I know where it is it's about I would say 100 meters south of the boundary but unfortunately the way that the Mulawati works there is it goes south and then there's a slight kink in it and then it turns back slightly and so he's on just on the other side of that kink so even with our cameras we're not going to be able to get a view of him up that way it's also so dense and thick and that will make life a lot more difficult now there is a shrike that VM has just found us a southern white crown shrike that is not playing the game for poor VM and is flying around all over the place there we go and it's one of our more beautiful birds that we see in this area it's a gray kind of coloration with a white head and that black eye stripe and then a little white chin patch so southern white crown shrike is what it's known as and fairly quite fairly common in in this area we see them quite regularly so nice bird to have and certainly a good one to tick off the list and if we're not going to have much luck with anything else birding will be a good part of our day so I'm pretty sure we will find some good birds as well although this wind is not ideal for birding I find that the birds get kind of swept away a little bit so they kind of sit in thicker denser areas and don't really spend too much time around there so around flying around so it's not ideal for birding either but we will at least persevere and check VM you reckon it's gonna rain today VM says nah looks looks a bit on the gray side doesn't it to the left there but I think it's more just hazy than anything else but a bit of a wind has kicked up now as well it was really pleasant most of the day today there wasn't really too much sign of wind during the day and, and now all of a sudden it's kicking up and this darker cloud is coming in from the left hand side so hopefully it won't rain while we're out I'm happy for it to rain once we get back home but not while we out on drive now let's see if our little bee eaters no no little bee eaters have flown away as well I was hoping they were gonna sit there on one of the small branches next to the road but they've gone deep in so uh, chances of us seeing them is now gone right Zoe's or the new road I think let's go new road let's go and check around there
Snazzy who's saying since all the rain soaks into the ground does that increase the risk of landslides well no not really you must remember that this soil has been baked hard by the sun it's been trampled by all kinds of animals and so the a lot of the rain is kind of just soaking in a little bit and then it's kind of being absorbed by the vegetation so things like the grasses the, the trees they are all basically picking up that water and sucking it up as much as possible so there's very little water actually sitting in the soil layer itself it's being absorbed quite quickly by all of the vegetation and therefore no risk of landslides now not so much it's only when we get heavy rain remember that we've only just had you know 15 20 millimeters of rain it's it's absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things our rainfall season sometimes we'll get between 600 millimeters and a thousand millimeters so we're on basically one one hundredth of our actual well sorry one yeah, one one hundred I would say of our actual total rainfall so we're not really anywhere near to being completely saturated if we get to a situation where we've had masses amounts of rain and we have a situation where it's very very wet like 2012 then yes landslides can be a bit of an issue and you will find banks of riverbeds caving in and a bit of a sort of give way of the substrates and that will cause a bit of an issue but for the most part now we don't have to worry it's still very dry and while it's not as dusty as it was a few days ago just give it a few days of sunshine and animals and, and cars driving around and you'll find that this place will look just like it did a few days ago in dust and it'll be very very dry so we need a lot more rain before we have to worry about landslides or any other issues at this stage but now this new road I was saying to VM has been a successful one for me I, I've driven it fairly regularly and I found a lot of good things on it. I've had quite a lot of luck with Shadow and the Cub on here, I've had Tingana on here, we've had wild dogs, we've had lions on kills here so it's a good road to, to check. I see a lot of elephant tracks up and down this road as well whether this is not the same herd that maybe Ali saw or it's a different herd I'm not quite sure but there's a lot of tracks of elephants going back and forth and so maybe we'll even find ourselves some Ellie's in this part of the world. Right, now it sounds like Ali maybe made her way past Gari Dam and has meandered her way into, well, the still very dry, very barren Mulawati drainage. It is very dry, however, the fact that it's very dry, sometimes it doesn't mean that there's absolutely no life. We have actually found some very big life once more. <laughs> Seems like there were lots of elephants around this this morning. <laughs> Always wonderful to see a lot of them around. Now I'm hoping the little ones that are with this female are also going to cross the road. Because hmm, there was a funny noise coming from a distance and I wonder what it was. But anyway, it seems like the little ones are indeed going to cross the road. And I do love an elephant crossing just because they're very really funny. Normally also when they step on the road there's also like that going quickly as in like if they're stepping on very hot sand and they just run across the road and back onto the other side. These two that we're watching clearly the mother and the youngster all the way over there. Well I, actually I don't think you're the mother but you're probably the older sister. You're a bit small to be the mother. Interesting, very interesting. We can hear them now every now and again when the wind dies down, all the munching and the breaking of trees all around us. Raya, you're nine years old and you want to know how much does a fully grown elephant weigh? Um, there's a little one again. Well, they... depends if you're a boy or a girl. Normally boys are a little bit bigger, but about maybe three to four tons three three and a half so that's probably a big truck they are heavy just as heavy as a truck so very 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 big things and they are the biggest animal that walks on land in all the world is the african elephant that we are looking at right now now it seems like she has decided to carry off also through the bushes so there is quite a quite a bit of life all around us however it seems that everyone's choosing to hide because like i said a little bit earlier it is a little bit windy and 
funny enough there's almost that feeling of rain in the sky so ahead of us it's starting to look very hazy very blue behind us there's still a blue sky so I wonder if perhaps tonight we're not gonna get a little bit more of rain or in the next few days if it's not gonna start raining again so hopefully it does because then this area will be lush again and lots of animals will find more food although for us it's gonna make it a little bit more complicated to find things as had it not been for the fact that it's very dry and not too many things have leaves, I don't think we would have been, well, this one did cross around, but I don't think we would have been able to spot too many, too many elephants. Oh, there's a nice big bull in there, but he's not posing nicely, but he's still quite an impressive guy. Oh, now he's moved his head and gone behind the bushes, hasn't he? Hmm. Oh, I think they're going to cross in front of us and I wonder, I can't see from here, but I wonder if we're also not in presence of a bachelor hood. Seems like there are going to be a few boys coming in front of us. Let me just... Alright. They are coming through. I think they're going to cross in front of us, being chased all around. So definitely all the ones that are going to be crossing in front of us, they all seem to be boys of different ages. So often young bulls will seek the company, uh, although you are a girl, so I got that one wrong. Boys will seek the company of older bulls to learn a few tricks and where to go and how to survive. So this one is clearly excited. You can see there's a lot of secretion on the temporal glands. And I wonder because of three, there's three bulls that are around here and that particular female that was moving along, if she's not actually going into estrus and that's the reason why the three of them have been pulled into this area and why they're trailing her so close, um, so close by. So I'm actually gonna go a little bit forward. Hopefully we'll be able to decipher the mystery. And normally when the females are receptive or are start or they start coming into the Easter cycle, you'll see that the males will often touch them and smell them and then put their trunks in their mouth to decipher all that all those pheromones and all that olfactory communication that is up in the air. Let's see, they seem to be fine and I wonder if perhaps this last bull that we saw, the bigger one, if he's not actually starting to come into must, judging by, it's almost like a faint wetting of the, there's another, there's the other bull, he's also quite a massive guy, although his tusks are not as big as the, as the other ones. They are, however, only giving us <laughs> the backside view of them. Hmm. Jackie, you're wondering how old elephants are when they start mating. Well, the females can become receptive normally. I think they will have their first one when they're about 16 or so. And the males, roughly the same age, but they will only start mating later on. They'll only get a chance to mate later on. Now there's a car behind us, so I'm just going to move around and allow them to go by because I think they've been trying to get ahead of us for quite a while, but they keep choosing the same roads as us. <laughs> Unfortunate for them. Maybe from here also we'll have another better look of the elephants. No, they all seem to be going down. And I wonder if these guys haven't actually gone or will not eventually make the way to the Molowati and then carry on. Hello! Make their way all the way back down there. But they do always seem to know where they're headed, even if to us it always looks like a mystery. And that's why everything that's animal movement, I find it so interesting, because for us it doesn't really make that much sense. As in, why are you coming here? Why didn't you rather go this route and go this here? But then when you read all of these studies about animal displacement and animal movement, then you're like, ah, <laughs> and you just realize how little you actually know about certain things concerning the movements of certain animals. Now they have gone too much into the bush so we're gonna leave them and carry on. Hopefully we'll find another herd because this has been a very nice early afternoon. Maybe we'll catch the rest of the herd on the other side. There's another road not too far from here so maybe if the herd is big enough then we'll see them coming down to the Molowati. Although I think for now that is a little bit of a stretch because I don't think the herd is big enough. So I haven't been able to see a few now that we've gone past them or gone a little bit forward. Nonetheless, who knows, we've been lucky, so maybe we'll find another herd when we go down there. Whew. The wind has definitely picked up a little bit. I'm sure you can hear it now. Hmm. 
All right, kitty cats, come back. So talking about cats, I was actually talking to Tristan about Kijima and um, oh, I can't remember the name of this male leopard of Tingana and Mvula and everything that happened yesterday. So I actually had a conversation with Shanae and because uh, after we showed her where Gijima was going then Gijima was definitely trailing uh, Mvula and then Gijima went straight to Mvula but they didn't fight they just walked side by side and she sent me this video very strange behavior of these two male leopards walking together and then an unknown female because they couldn't identify her they didn't know they they don't think that it was Ingrid Dam female just another skittish female just trailing behind them so that was very very strange so I actually think that whatever it is that happened happened in Bufelsuk. Yujima was just chasing Mvula and he just happened to chase him far enough to come across Tingana's territory. I don't think Tingana <laughs> was any way involved in this. Quite an interesting um, turn of events I must say because we did not expect all of that but I think it was just a chasing of one another away from a particular area because we know that Yujima likes or spends a lot of time in Bufelsuk so I think he just pretty much chased him away had a bit of a fight and then proceeded to mate repeatedly while Mbula was standing there. So very strange behavior from all of this leopard. Sometimes I don't really know what they get up to. <laughs> they just love confusing us. Oh, seems like Tristan is also driving about in the wind. So let's find out if he's got a song for the wind. I am bumbling, I'm having a good time. Vian and I are discussing all things wildlife and all kinds of interesting concepts. We were just discussing whether a tiger would survive out here in the Kruger and how it would fit into the situation and if it would be if we would release a female or a big male tiger, if we would going to release a tiger as to which one we would have out here and whether or not the female would fare better than the male. And so we've had a nice discussion about tigers and tigers and lions together and well, just all kinds of odd and wonderful things. We've also just been discussing the leopards and Gajima and Mvula in particular and, and the interaction because VM was filling me in on the sighting and telling me about the kind of way that things are going and we were discussing how tolerant Mvula seems to be of other leopards. For some reason he just seems to really not care too much about other leopards being around. He has shared kills with a number of the young boys and by the sounds of it yesterday he was just watching Gajima walking around which is pretty odd to me so anyway it's nice to hear that there was at least them around and hopefully Gajima didn't pick on Mvula too much we like seeing Mvula I've really enjoyed having him around as much as we have over the last little bit so it's been an absolute pleasure to kind of see him again and have him hanging about so I hope that Gajima didn't give him too much of a hard time what we did also see is we saw the Inkuhuma Pride tracks where they came back from Arethusa. Remember yesterday morning we tracked the Pride into Arethusa and I've just seen where they came back. They came back by Impala Plains and then all the way northwards into Biffles Hook. So it's a bit of a pity that they didn't decide to sleep on the southern side of the boundary. Apparently they're not far north of the boundary but it would have been nice if they did sleep on the southern side. It certainly would have made our life a lot better as we try and finish... well and as we try and kind of keep our cat streak going which is looking like it might be in danger this afternoon but still time to go and still bits of well bits of little information that we can still use and try and find one of our cats now Megan tells me this morning that she went out to have a bit of a run this morning and she came across a zombie zebra well this is what our conversation at breakfast started out as it will very quickly went into all kinds of other things and apocalyptic animals and whether which animal would be the worst one to face as a zombie but I digress but anyway the the, the zebra apparently which was really quite horrible was walking along and, and Megan said it looked all beautiful and across the road and Megan was taking photos of it with her cell phone and then she said that the zebra went into the bush and turned around to look at her and most of its one side of its face was all open and hanging off so I don't know what happened to it whether it was attacked by another zebra or if there was some sort of incident with maybe one of the cats or dogs who knows it's difficult to say but we'll have a look out for it because Megan says this is where she saw it so we'll have a little look 
look out and just see maybe this zebra is still hanging around and we can figure out what went on with it. I feel very sorry for it either way it doesn't sound like a nice wound at all and can you imagine your face being affected like that must be absolutely horrendous now while we contemplate zombie apocalypse animals and and poor zebras i believe ali has found a critter that is also probably feeling very sorry for itself in the talons of a bird of prey Well, luckily another one just joined the party, so we've got two shikros that we're looking at, and they're on a kill. So, whew, I think this weather has been fantastic for all the birds of prey. We've been extremely lucky with them the last few days. Now, unfortunately, one of them is covering our view a little bit, but they have definitely killed something that seems to be another bird. I can't really tell what other bird, it just seems sort of brownish in color or the plumage seems brownish in color, but I can't really tell from now. So I think we're looking at a pair and hopefully they'll have a nest somewhere around here. I'm just super excited about spring and all the birds having nests. <laughs> but this is, this is my first time ever to see two shikras together feeding off the same, off the same kill, which is very, very special, very unique. roll forward all right we are going to try and roll forward um, see if perhaps we can have a bit of a better view they are behind all sorts of branches of trees and so on as you can see from there and I'm just a little bit scared that they're gonna fly away but let's try hopefully we'll be able to have another look and we've been lucky enough to see them already so fingers crossed you stay there little birds Woohoo! reverse all right, sensor is just directing me. Um, maybe not. There we go. Oh, this is amazing. All right, um, should we try going forward? I think there's a bit of a gap. What do you think if I go back? All right, we're gonna try moving again. Hopefully, Senzo with his very quick birding. Okay, well, I thought you meant forward, forward. You want me to go back now? It's very tricky. I feel like we're almost spying on them. There we go. Beautiful. <gasps> now, I'm also a little bit puzzled. I would like to know what the what their prey species is but very hard to tell from here now i know it's a shikra because you can see a very prominent red eye and then yellow legs so that's um an easy way of uh, distinguishing this particular species of of bird of prey especially compared to some of the other ones that we get like the gabar goshawks and the lizard buzzards and all of them so yellow legs red eye always a shikra now there's quite a size difference in between the two, so I'm sure we're looking at a male and a female together. I'm gonna try and use my binoculars and see if maybe that'll give me another... No, the zoom of the camera is still more potent than my binoculars. And whatever it was, it almost looks like a chick. Like they, they ate somebody else's chick. And it was actually this one, the one that's feeding. The one that we saw flying away with its prey in the talons. And then the one on the left carried on going all the way there. And found it again. I think birds of prey have been very good to us in the last few days. All sorts of little secrets and all of them seem to have kills for some reason. So we know at least the birds have been kept very well fed. It's a very good day for the two of you, at least. Joshua, you're wondering if birds of prey would prey upon each other. Well, they can. It won't be their first option in terms of food source, but should they find the chicks of another one or find another bird of prey in another area where it's a good opportunity for them to hunt in, they might try. However, I think they would be easily persuaded to try for another prey species and not for a bird of prey just because of those talons that they use, that they, they use either to hunt or defend themselves. Well, you've just bullied someone out of this kill. That's not too nice. 
It's your time. And it's quite interesting because they must be part. This must be part of their mating or courtship display because normally they won't feed together, as far as I know, and they don't share kills with one another. But it would be quite interesting for me to go back and do a little bit more research on Shikra specifically because as far as I know, the only time where they will show this behavior is indeed when they're doing their courtship, when the male is trying to, to woo the female away or when they're a mated pair and they're trying to raise some of their chicks. Ah, there we go. Yep, there's definitely some mating going on. <laughs> or at least an attempt. <laughs> Thank you, Nature, for giving us that instant answer. <laughs> I think you failed though. So often when birds of prey are mating, the best gifts that they can present uh, a female with, it comes in the form of food. Uh, other species of bird will do it. Guinea fowl are very well known for doing it. And the males go in such a frenzy of bringing the females presents that they get, the females gain about 80% of their body weight and the males lose about 25% in this crazy fight to try and bring them food. So I think maybe what's happening here is exactly that. These birds of prey are also heading into their future parenthood and they're doing all the steps involved in getting there so courtship display mating behavior and then we saw a little bit of attempted mating going on so I'm sure in the next few months we're gonna be able to look forward to all sorts of little mean birds of prey fluffy tiny little things with very sharp talons flying around which I think is going to be just wonderful just proves how far right life is all around here They trying to get it all off. See, Nike, you're wondering if there's a way of differentiating males and females, if, unless I got that terribly wrong. Um, but uh, with chic, with chic, there we go. So the male is the one that is trying to be on top. <laughs> for mating purposes the females are normally the ones at the bottom but with shikras there's not there's not really any telltale as to which one is bigger or sorry which one is the male and which one is the female they both look pretty much the same and they have the same pattern the same coloration and everything else i think in this case we can all agree that the male seems to be a little bit smaller than the female but other than that they, for this particular bird of prey there isn't really a difference between the two Now, I think maybe this is still a young male and perhaps still needs a bit of practice because all the <laughs> attempts at mating have pretty much failed. So I don't know if he's just trying to play a sneaky one and then confuse her while she feeds. But this has been probably one of my best Shikra sightings ever. No, I don't think they caught such a big bird because at least from here it seems like it's almost finished. There isn't too much of that kill left there. It's funny that they face in our direction. It's almost like they can feel the zoom ganging in upon them. And there's also such a voracious appetite the way that they're feeding. And lucky for them, unlike perhaps when the leopards hoist their kills up on the trees, their talons seem to be very much sunking into the meat of their prey. So even if they fly away, likely it'll just be stuck to their talons and they'll be able to fly away. Or, oh, exactly like that. Maybe I jinxed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think he's gone. Yeah, he's gone back. Now, mm -hmm. Senzo, should we try going forward? I think there's a bit of a gap. Although that was a very artistic view that you proposed there, I loved it. Let me try going forward, if not then we'll come back to the spot because we all already know that this one works. Um. Ah, there we go. There we go, I think this might work. You see... I think this might work. Just takes us a little bit of time sometime when we reposition to try and find things with our own eyes and then of course with the camera. But there we go. Where's your kill? Is it still there? Oh, did you drop it? Mm. I think we have a fail. I think it dropped its kill and perhaps it's still, it's now at the bottom of that particular dead tree with some dead branches. Mm -mm. Kathy, you're wondering if these are migrating birds. No, the shikras do not migrate. They are here all year round and it's one of the few 
Uh, well, not one of the few, actually. We've got... Uh, 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 I can't even speak. We've got a few species of birds of prey, particularly the smaller ones that stick around all year long and then they don't migrate back and forth. The Shikra is one of them, but the Wahlberg's eagle that we were looking at earlier, that is one of the most notorious migrating species that we get around here. I would say that the little goshawks, hawks, uh, they stay around here in general all throughout the year. <laughs> You're looking very mean. Is your food gone? She dropped it. How could she? What a nice little find. This has been very cool. I'm glad the birds were around to keep us entertained. Who knew? We went from a very big grey thing to a small <laughs> flying little grey one. And I think maybe just going back to Tristan's comment, <laughs> maybe if any small bird would be able to become a zombie, I reckon secrets would just because of their very <laughs> red eyes. James, you have a better outlook on them. You say that it's a secret date night. I think it definitely is. They, you know, took her out for, for dinner. Who knows, maybe they'll go catch a movie later. <laughs> Hopefully they will not follow the example of the Safari Live crew because we just seem to fall asleep whenever we're watching a movie. <laughs> Off you go! <laughs> Gone back to perch in the same tree. Such stunning little birds. And I'm always amazed at the sheer power that they've got. I mean, because if you compare it to the eagles like the Wahlbergs and especially... Oh, maybe there is something there. Ah! You got it! <gasps> and here I was, thinking that you actually dropped it. Huh. Interesting. I have definitely lost them this time. I don't know where they went. I think they've gone all the way back into the bushes, so it's a little bit difficult. I can't actually see them anymore, but how cool was that? <laughs> that was very nice. Very strange behavior, but woohoo! We've got a new... I think maybe we should start a list of all the birds of prey that we're gonna see with kills, considering that this is that time of the year when they all start giving each other gifts in the forms of dead birds and food and so on. So maybe... So maybe we'll get lucky. And uh, <laughs> Megan is saying that I've been very lucky lately, and indeed it's been very lucky. They've just been around, which is wonderful. So hopefully the streak will continue, because it's always interesting to learn a little bit more about the portrait displays and the mating behavior of every individual species of, of bird. And I find it, I don't know if, anyone, if anybody else's brain works this way, but for me I'm very visual when it comes to learning so if I see something and then I read upon it then I'll be able to remember it a million times better and it'll make sense to me whereas if I just read upon something without ever having to seen it uh, having seen it then I just make up my own story in my head <laughs> and then it becomes a little bit harder for me to remember it but Chigra is definitely gonna stick in my head after this wonderful sighting we've had now, I don't know, maybe I'm going to start wishing for another bird. I think even, funny enough, we even had the Marshall Eagle on a kill the other day, which was quite something. And it lasted it for, for a long time. I thought it was probably just going to be there for that afternoon and then fly off. But then Tristan had it the following morning, which is very good. Very good for all of us. Now, it is getting a lot chillier, so I think... Let's head down to Trindam's. Perhaps maybe Mr. Hosanna would have woken up from his slumber and come for a drink. That is what I'm hoping for. Although I can't really blame him if he carries on sleeping in this weather. This is the perfect weather to just sleep and be warm and comfortable. So, I don't know. I'm hoping maybe the elephants go around and then just wake him up and then he'll come have a drink. And then we'll let him go back to his kill, just because we're not mean people. Now, I wonder what other leopard could have been around this morning. Hmm. Seems like Tristan has gone all the way to the opposite end of the reserve and he's gone very close to Sydney's dam so let's go over to him and find out if he can see any buffalo like last time. No, unfortunately no buffalo like last time which is a shame. I was hoping we'd find something like that. What we have found is tracks for one male leopard going north into Buffalo's Hook. So I don't know whether it's Kijimo or Mvula that headed that way, but definitely one of them from last night going northwards into sort of the eastern side of Sydney's dam. So not ideal. I was hoping that we would find tracks for them. The female and, and male tracks that we found all look like yesterday. crash gun in the history of I'm so happy um 
there he is, beautiful boy Tamba, I would assume. My very first time to actually find him and I think I'm so happy I might just even start crying. Today I was laughing and I was telling Lou that every time that I've tried to go and look for Tamba, I've had no such luck because he seems to be Tristan's boy, but oh, I'm so happy right now, yay! So we've got our spots for Kat today and I'm sure he was the one that was around uh, at Inges and the one that everything was alarming at earlier on. We actually said probably the Molawati somewhere around there, so hello. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Somebody's being very lazy, I know, I can't blame you. Look at that flick of that tail. Mm, maybe he spotted something that he's trying to, to hunt. So in, I, I'm actually loving this corner. The other day we came up and then we saw wild dogs and then today we come up and then we see a leopard. I have to carry on doing this. Now I'm gonna try going a bit forward. I don't know if he's actually stalking something or something. <laughs> Megan in FC says she wants some of my lucky beans too. Maybe I think I'm just gonna have to find more lucky beans and then just have them in a pot just in case. What are you doing? Are you hunting something? I don't know what you're doing, but I don't want to I don't want you to cheat. Don't use me to cheat. In certain areas, leopards they start using the vehicles and they learn that a car can muffle their sounds and their um so they'll start moving around when only when the vehicle moves and they learn to use the cars to hunt. So we try not to do that from an ethical perspective as much as he as I want him to have a very long life. Um we don't want to be unfair to some of the other creatures around. So I don't know if there's something in there that he's looked at. I don't know if there's a tiny bird or perhaps a hare that could be hiding in there. But we're just going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't actually using us. And that he's posing oh so beautifully for us. Oh, your tail. So pretty and so long. Look at that. A leopard's tail. He's definitely thinking about something. There's something that's got his head and you can always tell with leopards just by looking at that flick of that tail. It's always like involuntary movement. Oh, look at those eyes. Oh, my goodness. You are... Palin, you say that leopards, you're convinced that leopards' tails have a mind of their own. I agree. I think <laughs> tails do whatever it is that they want and they're just somewhat attached to the leopard but they have no control over them. <laughs> They're so expressive, these tails of theirs. Oh, you are just stunning, aren't you? I'm so happy. Beautiful. Look at those pretty ears. Hmm. I wonder what he's up to. So he's definitely been around and I think a few days ago Tristan mentioned that he strikes an... Ah, oh, Impala. Now I see what you're looking at. So since the two are left in the drainage, that's what he's looking at. Hmm. that are here next to him. They've all started crossing and funny enough we are at the exact same spot where the where the wild dogs were just yesterday afternoon so clearly a very successful spot for animals to come and have a nap and he is still looking at them so he must feel pretty invisible at the fact that he's still got his head up straight up like that. Oh I think is that an impala? I don't know if one of them wanted to come across, but I see a lot of them. A lot of the impala are starting to run from the drainage line. And they should come out roughly in front of him. Interesting. Very interesting. Alright, I'm gonna go forward, seeing he's already chosen his route, so that we can have another look and see what he's gonna get up to. So I think 